there is so much more that needs to be spoken about that is not spoken about. So that's exactly what we're going to be talking about in this video. So the part of ETCO2 that we don't really realize is that if the graph goes up or if the graph goes down, people can get very confused about what that means. So what I'm going to be talking about here is that what actually impacts the increase of that number, what actually impacts the decrease of that number and how we should be reading that and responding to it. So when you look at what ETCO2 is, it's not just one thing, it's a combination of a bunch of things. So we obviously have the CO2 or the carbon dioxide moving in and out of our blood, all right? So we have the breathing part. If we stop breathing, your ETCO2 changes, or if you hypoventilate or hyperventilate, your ETCO2 changes. You know, it depends on whether it goes up and down, it's depending whether you breathe faster, breathe slower, or stop breathing. So there's the breathing aspect or the lung aspect of ETCO2. And then there is the heart aspect. So it's the pumping of the blood around the body. Is the body actually able to send the CO2 from your kidney and liver and spleen and brain and heart and muscles to the lungs to then be excreted into the air? And then is the organ even creating enough CO2? So if your body is dying, your CO2 drops because there is no CO2 being produced. Or if your body is not able to perfuse efficiently to send the CO2 that's in the blood into the lungs, you can have a low CO2. A metabolic alkalosis or a metabolic acidosis, that is going to change how much CO2 is in your blood. So you're going to have changes in that, not because of how fast or how slow someone's breathing, but because of the, the actual metabolic impact of what that has on your blood gas and on your ETCO2. So it's not just a, the patient is now hyperventilating because the graph's getting smaller and smaller, or the number's really high, so we should now ventilate quicker because there's more ETCO2 to blow off. It's, it's not that simple, it's not that straightforward. So really what is happening in what the textbooks is saying is that if we see a number that is very high, we need to acknowledge that the patient is breathing off a lot of CO2. We can probably trust that number is also what we've been told. So if your ETCO2 is above 45, it's probably a accurate reading. So the patient is blowing off a lot of CO2, whether that means that they are producing a lot of CO2 uh, because there's some sort of metabolic issue that's going on or they have like malignant hypothermia, you're going to see a huge amount of CO2 coming off. Or is the patient hypoventilating or have they just come out of ROSC and now they have a very high CO2. So, so there's many reasons why you're going to have a very high ETCO2. However, when it comes to a low ETCO2, what are we seeing? What are we reading? So when we have a low ETCO2, it's probably a unpredictable number or a unreliable number more so because what happens when you have a low ETCO2 is that you probably have a state of low perfusion. So if my blood pressure is low, if my heart rate's low, if my perfusion is low, you're going to have a low ETCO2. But it doesn't mean the patient is hypoventilating or hyperventilating or something is wrong with their lungs. It's probably something wrong with their heart or their perfusion status. So if you see low ETCO2 with a patient who shouldn't have a low ETCO2, it doesn't mean we need to now ventilate them slower. If a patient is in shock, so let's say they're in a like third degree heart block, they're in peri-arrest, they will have a very low ETCO2, even if they're breathing adequately. Nothing wrong with their lungs, they're breathing normally, normal volume, normal rate, they will have a low ETCO2, not because they are blowing off too much carbon dioxide, but because they can't get the carbon dioxide from the blood to the lungs to actually excrete for the sensor to pick up. So that's really important to understand. So in summary, if you have a very high ETCO2, it is a very reliable indicator that that is what your PCO2 probably is. And so there is either a metabolic acidosis, and so now they're blowing off a lot of CO2, or they are breathing in a different way or they're breathing too slowly, which is then increasing their actual CO2 because of a lung problem. And now we need to fix their ventilation. So it's either a metabolic problem, increasing your CO2, or it is a lung problem, which is obviously we're not blowing off enough CO2. And so then your CO2 will increase. If you have a very low ETCO2, it is not a reliable indicator of what your actual PCO2 is. So if you have a low ETCO2, your PACO2 might be very high. They're not 
correlated when it's very low. It is unreliable. So if you have a low ETCO2, the patient is probably in shock. If they're hypotensive or they're in a bradycardia or if they're whatever the case is, the patient's in shock. If they've lost a lot of blood, they're going to have a low ETCO2, not because they're not breathing, but because their body's not able to circulate that blood. So when you see someone who has got a low ETCO2, you can fix their perfusion and their ETCO2 will fix itself. So guys, I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, that's just something that really is not spoken about enough. And we focus so much on the numbers and the graph, but we're trying to actually narrow down what do those mean and how do we treat these things. So if I've missed anything, guys, I'd love for you to drop something at the bottom. I'm sure we all have a wealth of knowledge that we could share with each other. And guys, thanks for your time. If you did enjoy this, please check out this video because this was really game changing for me.